Okay, uh, so thank you, Paolo. Um, so today uh, I'm going to give a kind of a retrospective talk about research that my lab, the McLearn Lab, has done with a digital learning game that we call Decimal Point. Um, this is the first time I've given this talk. Uh, I fear I might have a little bit too much material to cover, so I'll keep my eyes on the clock and may jump ahead if I'm pushing too close to 5.30, because it's always good to have questions and uh, some discussion. Oops. Um, so as you probably all know, digital learning games are now sort of omnipresent and widely available in many schools at least in the US, use digital learning games as part of classroom instruction. In addition, many researchers and companies have sort of jumped on the bandwagon and are creating, selling, and distributing learning games. Um, I took notice of this trend during the many classroom studies I did with intelligent tutors in middle school classrooms. So this made me curious um, about whether or not digital learning games really help kids learn. And what I found out is the evidence is pretty limited. So um, there, at that time, uh, the evidence said that their games can lead to more engagement and learning potentially uh, than conventional instructional technology, but the evidence in general was lacking. And in mathematics in particular, it was lacking. Um, so Mayer, uh, did, uh, uh, wrote a book in 2014, and he evaluated the published scientific evidence in which a learning game was compared to a more traditional instructional approach, what he called a media comparison study. And he only found five rigorous studies in mathematics, and of those, only three showed learning benefits with a really small effect size. So thus, I, I decided to explore the space together with my original collaborator, uh, Jody Forlizzi. Um, so what I'd like to do in this talk, two general themes. One, the first one is actually the, the more elaborate one. And that's, I'm gonna um, discuss the studies and findings we found with Decimal Point, the learning game my lab has designed and, and, and developed starting in 2014. But I also wanna take a little bit of time to talk about how instructional technology, and in this case, a learning game, can act as a platform for exploring various learning science issues. So let's talk a bit about the appeal of games. I'd like to cite some stats about digital um, learning games. Oops, something happened. The uh, chair went away. Yeah, the share disappeared. Okay. Technology in real time, folks. Yeah, I don't know how that happened, but okay. So, um, so there's evidence that a high percentage of people play digital games. And second, there are reports of kids in particular playing digital games as much as 42 hours. We're, we're not are you, are you not seeing the slides? Oh, shoot. Not okay. yet. No. Oops. I don't know how that happened. Okay. I guess I'm going to need to go back here and share screen. Okay. Okay. Everyone can see it now. No. No? You no. still can't see it? No. Strange. It was working earlier. Yeah. I don't know why it disappeared. It's showing that uh, I have it here, but let, oh, here, wait a minute. How now we see it. The two general themes of the talk. Is that what you're saying? I, yes. Yes. Okay. Which I've already said. So, okay. So, uh, so let me pick up again here. That was strange. Um, so second, there are reports of children, you know, playing digital games up to 42 hours a week. So there is precedent for using games as a tool for supporting learning in the sense that they're already being used quite a bit by people in general and children in particular. And so there's a natural tension in learning games between enjoyment and learning. And this table taken from a Mayer and Johnson paper shows the potential and pitfalls of digital learning games. 
crossed against game features and instructional features. And I like this table because I think it's one of the best illustrations of the trade-offs between enjoyment engagement on one hand and learning with digital games on the other hand. So um, game features can be engaging, but at the same time, they can be distracting. And on the other side, instructional features can promote learning, but can also be boring. So that's kind of the, the tension between learning and, um, and, and engagement with games. There's a variety of theory that is cited for the benefits of learning games. So for instance, flow theory, which posits that people can become so engaged that time passes quickly and, and they're, they're so concentrated that and enjoyment is deeply felt, that's often cited as a reason for the benefits of uh, learning games. Um, in addition, James G is pretty well known in this space, and he's uh, put forth 36 principles of learning with games, including what he calls an active learning principle and a committed learning principle. And then um, one of the early theory theorists in this space is uh, Tom Malone, who discussed how games often trigger intrinsic motivation with features such as fantasy, curiosity, and challenge. There's a lot of other theory that could be cited too, but this is just a sampling. So let me talk a little bit about the game now, moving into the specifics of the decimal point game, which op this basically operates on an amusement park metaphor in which students travel through a theme park, which you're seeing here on the screen, playing a variety of what we call mini games that help students learn decimal concepts and operations, such as place value, comparing decimal magnitude and add adding decimals. In the base version of the game, Students follow the amusement park map, as you can see here, the dotted line here, and they, they play the games in sequence. And there's a group of fantasy characters that encourage students to play and congratulate them when they correctly solve problems. There's a wide variety of the mini games within decimal point, including ones to practice addition of decimal numbers, to place decimals in less than and greater than buckets, to practice number line placement, and to sort decimals um, in less than and greater than order. And these are just examples of a few of the, the mini games within decimal point. All of the uh, mini games and, and problems in decimal point are built using learning science principles. So for instance, um, each mini game targets an established decimal misconception, such as longer decimals are larger. That is, kids frequently think that, for instance, a decimal like 0 0.125 is greater than 0 0.82 simply because the former decimal is longer. And this probably comes because kids learn whole numbers before decimals, and that heuristic works with whole numbers, but of course not with decimals. Um, another learning science principle that we use um, in the game is self-explanation, which is one of the most robust of learning science principles. And our tests target on uh, near, medium, and far transfer learning. The mini games of decimal point are essentially self-contained intelligent tutors built with CTAD, an authoring tool we have been using for years. And the game runs on the internet, and takes advantage of tools we've developed at CMU, such as tutor shop and data shop. The tutor shop being how we deploy the games and the data shop being how we capture student data. Um, we design and develop a common set of, of components aggregated together, which are shared across the mini games. And this supports shared stylistic elements across the games, the mini games. Uh, we use playtest design concepts to develop the game. For instance, we used a co design process in which students acted as producers rather than consumers in the early stages of our design work. And the co design sessions involved 32 sixth grade children. Uh, what happened? Did it go again? Yes, unfortunately. Oh, this is bad. I don't know why it keeps doing this. Yeah, it, my, my screen flashed and then I suddenly lost the screen share. Uh, let me see if I can get it back now. Can you see it? Back again? Okay. Yes. So that's annoying. I don't know why that's happening. Anyway, um, 
So these sessions um, involved input on both known and established games, as well as presenting the students with some preliminary concepts that we had devised. So some of the key ideas that emerged from our sessions with kids were that students mentioned 54 different games with their top choices being Minecraft, Angry Birds, and Temple Run. So a sidebar, of course, is this was done in 2014 when there were probably many different games than there are today. So it'd be interesting to see how this may have changed in the intervening years, but that's what the way it was in 2014. The students particularly like games with familiar real world metaphors. Um, and this feedback led us to the idea of an amusement park with a series of mini games. So we've been interested in and have explored a variety of research questions over the eight plus years we worked and experimented with the game. Uh, so for instance, uh, the first and most basic question we wanted to answer was, does decimal point lead to better learning than a more conventional non-game instructional approach? And does the game lead to more enjoyment than the more conventional approach? Um, we also, along the way, um, came up with a finding that female students tended to benefit more uh, um, from the game. So a question that we were asking ourselves as we did subsequent experiments is, do they um, do the students, female students, benefit more or less or the same as compared to male students in different versions of the game? Uh, we also um, explored the concept of agency. So do students learn more or less and enjoy more or less when they're given more agency in playing decimal point? By that, I mean giving them choices and more control over what's, what's happening in the game. And do students learn more or less and enjoy the game more or less if they're presented with a, a version of the game that's sort of more learning focused versus enjoyment focused? Here we wanted to explore that tension between learning and enjoyment in a game. We also wanted to see how hints and error messages provided in the context of the game would, would benefit students. And um, we also were able to test how the instructional context, classroom versus remote learning, impacted playing of the game and learning. And this was because of the pandemic, we were able to do this kind of testing. We further explored different types of self-explanation in the context of the game to see which led to best learning and enjoyment outcomes. And the most recent study we did was we um, explored how mindfulness training provided in conjunction with the game could enhance learning outcomes. So you can see we really have, have investigated a broad set of questions. So the first, oh, yeah, there it goes again. Very annoying. Okay, back. At least I know how to get back quickly. Uh, so you can see it again now, right? <laughs> yes. It just flashes and then my screen goes blank and then this is what happens. But anyway, I'm not sure why that is. Um, okay, so the first study was basically about comparing the learning game to a more conventional instructional um, approach. And basically, we compared the game in the in the uh, base version of it, as I've explained before, where um, students would play all of these. Uh, there are 24 mini games shown in the overall amusement park, and they would play each game twice. And we compared that um, to um, a con more conventional approach, where the same exact content was provided, um, as well as. Um, following up with self-explanation. Um, there was self-explanation following each of the mini games in the original version of the uh, of decimal point. So everything was pretty much the same, except one was a game environment, one is a, a non-game environment. Um, this was uh, reported in a, a paper from 2017 in the International Journal of Game-Based Learning. So what we did here, again, we compared these two conditions. Um, and essentially, we had a pretest, post test, and a delay test. The tests were ABC forms that we uh, that were isomorphic to one another, and we positionally counterbalanced them within condition, so that one third of the students in each condition received test A as the pretest, one third received test B as the pretest, and one third got test C. And likewise for the post test and delayed test. And the test items were designed to probe for specific decimal misconceptions and had some near medium and far transfer items. Um, 
uh, the design of all the studies we subsequently did basically use the same material. So this is the only time I'll show this, this grid. And what we found is that the game group um, learned significantly more than the non-game group, group on both the post-test and the delayed post-test with a pretty high effect size as well. Uh, the non-game group made significantly more errors than the game group. And with respect to enjoyment, the game group also enjoyed um, significantly more than the non-game group um, in terms of liking the intervention significantly more, thinking the intervention interface was easier to use and having more positive feelings about math after the intervention. So from there, we, we looked at this uh, study uh, with respect to student autonomy. Um, and what, what here we were looking at is um, agency as a, as a game feature. That is allowing players to make their own decisions about play during use of a game. Agency is often seen as related to um, uh, engagement and consequently learning and fun. And engagement um, is, of course, also related to self-regulated learning, or I'm sorry, agency is also related to self-regulated learning, which dependent on a student's SRL abilities could be either helpful or harmful to learning. There are some examples of others who have explored this concept before us, but the study that actually inspired um, our study was conducted by Sawyer et al. Um, in the context of the Crystal Island game. And what they did is compared three conditions where in one condition, students were able to move freely through the islands of the Crystal Island game, if, if those of you know that, but it's basically a science game where um, they're trying to, the, you're, you're a scientist who has to discover what the root cause of an infectious disease is. So in the high agency condition, the students were able to move and do what they wanted. In the low, they, they were, um, it, they had to investigate in a fixed order and in the no um, agency condition, they basically just watched a video, which would be essentially a worked example. And they found that the low agency students attempted more incorrect submissions, but also learned more. Okay, so um, the way that we uh, put this uh, study together is um, we presented students with a dashboard that displays the five different categories of mini games as well as the specific games within each category. And many games that have been played um, are, are marked in red. Uh, and, and you can mouse over the game icons to learn about what each game, uh, what kind of uh, content is in each game, what, what you'd learn from each game. And students can play anywhere between 24 and 72 um, iterations of the mini games in order of, of their own choice which is not, again, like the, the base game where they have to follow the, the pathway that's provided. Um, and basically, uh, we, also, we also had, by the way, uh, the, the low agency condition, which is the, the base version. And the results of this were published in a, an AI Ed 2018 paper. And the, the results show that for learning, there was no significant difference between the high and low agency groups which surprised us to some extent. Uh, maybe even more surprising is there was no significant difference between high and low agency groups with respect to, to age, um, with, uh, um, with respect to enjoyment. And we thought that the high agency students would enjoy the game more. Um, additional analyses that we did, we found out that 54 of the 81 high agency students played the same number of mini games as the low agency. Um, and 18 of the 81 high agency students followed the canonical sequence. Finally, the, the, the amount they differed from the canonical sequence of the low agency um, version of the game was a relatively minor deviation. So all of this just points out the fact that even though we provided agency to students, they didn't really exercise it. So why did the students um, not generally exercise agency? Um, well, students were given choices, autonomy, but they may not have felt in control. So for instance, being in a classroom with a teacher present could have given many students a sense that they were not as free to make choices as we hoped. The other thing importantly, which we'll come to a follow on study is that perhaps also the dotted line connecting all of the mini games could have implicitly, but in unintentionally communicated the sequence of the games to play. 
Secondly, um, while self-regulated learning is clearly hoped for with this intervention, not all students exercise good SRL. And finally, the bottom line is that the hoped for student autonomy did not occur. And this could have been because of the teacher and or classroom setting, the indirect control of the dotted line or students not exercising good SRL. So given these results, we wanted to look more deeply into this issue of indirect control and autonomy. So we, and this I call study 2A because it just is a real uh, uh, a small step beyond that study I just described. And here we wanted to look in particular at the design of the, uh, the map and whether or not that exerts ind indirect control on players by com communicating this implicit order of, of uh, games to play. And Jesse Shell has defined indirect control as, as, as subtle cues or design elements that can lead players towards certain and perhaps unwanted behaviors. Um, indirect control can be exerted in a variety of ways, including um, with game goals, interface elements, and visual design. So um, to explore the indirect control conjecture, we ran this follow-up study, and we compared these uh, three conditions. Um, the, the low uh, agency condition is the one where they, they don't have any choice. They have to just follow uh, the, the map. The high agency with, with the line is the same as the prior study where they can play anywhere from 24 to 72 um, iterations of the game and they can bail out when they want after they've at least played 24 games. Um, but it has the line. And then we had a third condition where there was no line. And we wondered if that would the indirect control might, uh, or lessening that might make a difference. And this was reported in a paper uh, in which Eric Harpstee was the uh, first author from 2019. What we found is that the learning, there were no significant differences in learning gains between these three groups. But we did note that um, the, both the HAL and the HAL N learning had higher learning efficiency than the, um, the low agency condition. But there was no learning efficiency difference between the HAL and HAL N uh, conditions. There was no significant difference between the, the groups with respect to enjoyment. And on post hoc analyses, students in the HAL and HAL and AL conditions played fewer mini games than in the low agency. And the students in the HANAL condition deviated from the canonical sequence significantly more than students in the, in the HAL condition. So remember that HANAL is the one without the line and they did significantly deviate from the, from the path. Further post hoc analysis, we did a cluster analysis where we defined these um, four different clusters, um, a canonical sequence where students played pretty close stayed pretty close to the prescribed order of games, an initial exploration one where they initially jumped around um, in exploring, a half on top where they only played games at the, at the top of the map, and a half on left where they played um, games mostly on the left. Those were the four clusters we found. There was no difference in learning across the four uh, clusters, but there was a significant difference in enjoyment across the clusters. So in effect, the half on left had uh, expressed higher enjoyment than the half on top. And this could in indicate that at least some students exercised agency um, because the half on left would deviate more from, from the canonical sequence, meaning that they were expressing more uh, um, agency in that case. And this is reported in a, in a paper um, from 2019. Okay, so um, moving on to a third study. How are we doing on time, by the way? We're about a half hour in, I guess, right? Yeah. Yep, okay. So in this study, um, we were looking at this idea of learning focus versus enjoyment focus in a learning game. And a good game-based learning environment creates this sort of tension, as I mentioned earlier, between enjoyable and engaging features and instructional features. Uh, some prior studies have compared enjoyment and learning in the same game, but in contrast, our goal was to compare enjoyment and learning by comparing different versions of the game that explicitly emphasize either enjoyment or instructional aspects of the game. And I'll show you in a minute what, what we mean by that. 
So um, we wanted to explore, explore this trade-off between enjoyment and learning. And so to conduct this study, we designed three conditions that differ based on how students are presented game information and control through a dashboard that's attached to the main game map. So the learning focus condition features an open learner model where the knowledge components are the five decimal skills targeted and decimal point. And the bars here indicate the mastery probability of each skill, which is computed by um, Bayesian knowledge tracing. And we also, it also recommends three specific mini games for students to pick next, which are chosen from the top two skills that students need improvement on. Our intention is that this would encourage students to practice more on these skills, but they could also choose not to follow these recommendations. Um, the enjoyment focus condition, on the other hand, featured an analog to the open learner model by displaying the student's enjoyment level of each skill, skills that we've renamed, you know, to appear more playful, uh, such as pattern perfect and, and uh, arrange and exchange. We collected this enjoyment data shown here by asking students to rate every mini game round that they finished from one to five and the score uh, of a skill is the average score of all mini games belonging to that skill. So similar to the learning condition, we also recommend three mini games from the game types that the student liked the most so far in their playing of the overall game. And then finally, um, the last condition is the control, which simply displays a list of all the mini games and marks the games that have been played and with the red text color. So this design is neutral with respect to both learning and enjoyment. Another difference about the control condition is that students had to finish all the mini games once before they could replay more rounds. And this is a feature that was present in, in prior studies with decimal points, so we wanted to preserve it here. We hypothesize that the learning focused version of the game would lead to the best learning outcome, whereas the enjoyment focused version of the game would lead to the best enjoyment outcome. And this is reported in a paper from 2020 uh, at AI Ed. Okay, so results. Um, learning, there, was no, there were no significant differences between the learning focused, enjoyment focused and control group. But here's um, one of the studies where we found that female students learned significantly more on near and medium transfer items. Um, we actually found this result uh, in an earlier study, I didn't mention it, um, and, but this was this path of, we, we've replicated this, um, this finding in five studies altogether. In, in enjoyment, there was no significant difference between the learning uh, focused, enjoyment focused and control groups according to these uh, achievement emotion, game engagement and effective engagement. And with, post, with respect to post hoc analyses, um, we, with mini games we found, mini game rounds, we found that the order of, of the number of mini games played was, was in the order of control greater than learning focus, greater than enjoyment, enjoyment focus. And recall that students in all three conditions could choose to stop playing at any time after finishing the first 24 rounds. So with respect to uh, what we called mini game replay rate, which means how often they would decide to replay a game, we found that the learning focus condition had a much higher uh, replay rate than the enjoyment um, focus condition at a significant level. So um, surprisingly, we didn't see either a learning or enjoyment difference between conditions, which we, we thought we had set up by having these different uh, dashboards. But on the other hand, our dashboards did prompt students towards signif significantly different learning behaviors. In particular, um, the learning focus condition did more repeated practice and the enjoyment focus condition did more exploration, which is what you might expect. Um, a key question is why no learning differences? Well, uh, first, although there are obvious differences in, in the game dashboard in each condition, the students still spend most of the game in the actual mini games, which are identical across the conditions. Secondly, because um, open enjoyment models are not familiar to students, they may not have been able to use uh, that device effectively. Um, another possible reason is about our study setting. We did our study in a real classroom environment where students had limited time to play and were aware of the post-tests. So these factors may have negated the playful atmosphere that the enjoyment condition was trying to emphasize. 
Uh, in addition, um, once again, as I mentioned, this was one of five studies that we've conducted that um, in which female students had significantly better learning outcomes than male students. And this actually occurred in earlier studies. Um, again, uh, it didn't, didn't mention it. Uh, I'll say more about this later. Study four, um, we wanted to explore the uh, benefits of adding hints and error messages to the game. Um, so while hints and, error and feedback may seem an obvious inclusion to game-based learning, the research is actually divided on this point. So on one hand, much of ITS research has shown the benefits of hints and feedback. But on the other hand, it could be that hints and feedback could disrupt the engagement and flow of students, which is a key to game-based learning. And some studies have even shown this outcome. Um, in addition, the pandemic provided us with a unique opportunity to explore the use of educational technology in the classroom versus at home. Um, we were conducting this experiment and had already been in two schools when the pandemic forced us um, to um, continue the learning from home. So thus we conducted half of the study uh, with three schools at, at the schools and three where they were at home. While that's of course unfortunate, we, we did um, take the opportunity to do a comparison between at-home learning versus um, in the classroom. So um, the way this worked is um, we extended the original low agency version of the game, um, whereas in the hint condition, students played a version of the game that in addition to correctness feedback, um, provided on-demand hints, and there's an example of one uh, in the box there, and error messages on common student errors, such as this. One of the characters pops up and, and tells uh, the student they've made a common error. Um, and this was compared to uh, the no hint condition where students played the original version of the game that, that did provided no hints and only correctness feedback, uh, that is turning correct answers green and, and uh, incorrect answers red. Um, so because this, again, study was run both pre and post COVID, we were able to further explore the effects of an in-class versus remote learning with the game. So this in effect allowed us to do a two by two study crossing hint and no hint with classroom and remote. And this is reported in a computers and education paper that was published earlier this year. So the results, um, that we got or regarding completion rate, the different instructional settings led to significantly different completion rates. And this is likely due to the students in the classroom being monitored by experimenters and teachers. And they had a high a completion rate of almost 89%. Well, students at home were not monitored as strictly, at least we don't think they were because they were working from home. Um, and it was also in the early days of the pandemic when uh, schools and parents were probably not pushing their kids as hard to, to finish content that they were working on from school. Regarding learning, the remote students learn significantly more than the classroom students. But again, this was likely due to the fact that in the remote condition, probably more of the stronger students or the, strong, the students that were better supported at home finished the materials. And in addition to the, the two versions of the game, the hint and no hint conditions led to different classroom versus remote results. In particular, on the delayed post-test, Students in the no hint condition did significantly better in the classroom, while there was no significant difference between conditions at home. Um, another finding, again, was that female students learn more in the classroom than male students. Again, the effect I've, I've talked about previously. But the same effect did not occur remotely. Um, post hoc, uh, we, we note that students in the hint condition use significantly more hints in the classroom than remotely. And in addition, higher prior knowledge students used hints more productively with significant negative correlation between hints and learning gains. So a few points of discussion. The different completion rate, as I mentioned earlier, as well as better learning outcomes from remote students were likely due to the better supervision and guidance in the classroom than at home. Students at home, especially because this was at the beginning of the pandemic, may have been demotivated and not pushed to work. Not surprisingly, the higher uh, performing students persevered, completed the materials more frequently and performed better. Um, but second, why did students in the no hint condition do better in the classroom on the delayed post-test? 
And we um, we conjecture that in light of um, the ICAT framework from Chi and Wiley, this may not be surprising uh, in that the no-hint students may have worked harder and struggled harder to construct their knowledge and thus learned more. Um, also, a learning curve analysis showed us that no-hint students initially did worse than hint students, but eventually they did the same. And finally, why did female students in the classroom do better than male students on the immediate post-test? Um, girls performed the same in both contexts, but interestingly, boys did much better at home. So, and, and this follows some prior research that girls tend to outperform boys in classroom settings. Being mindful of the time, five, 10, okay. So I might just skip the sixth study and get to the, uh, the general points I wanna make. But let's talk about the fifth study. Um, prompted self-explanation in a digital learning game. Uh, we wanted to explore different types of self-explanation in the context. Remember, there is a self-explanation in the game. They haven't talked about it much, but it's this menu-based self-explanation that occurs after they play each of the individual mini games. Um, so, and prompted self-explanation is a feature of instructional technology in which learners are essentially induced to explain their work. Um, and as, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of the robust learning science principles, most robust uh, learning science principles. And prompted self-explanation has been shown in a variety of studies, including uh, the, the well-known one that Vincent and Ken did back in 2002 with geometry steps, and also um, a study that Kanadi and Van Lane did in 2000, and many studies um, since then. Interestingly, there's a prompted self-explanation study that Johnson and Mayer did in 2010, where they found that menu-based prompts led to better learning than open-ended prompts. Um, and, and that was sort of the inspiration for us to explore this, this issue in the context of our game. So um, we set out to experiment with different versions of self-explanation that would be prompted after problem solving. And to do this, um, we looked at the um, uh, continuum that Wiley and Chi put together between unconstrained and highly constrained self-explanations. And according to, oh, lost it again. There it goes. Sorry. Uh, I apologize for this. Okay, is it sharing now? Can you, you can you see? We see the entire screen. Yep. Not, okay. Oh, there we go. There, there we go. Yep. All right. Okay. So um okay, so the there was uh this continuum from unconstrained self-explanations to highly constrained uh self-explanations that Wiley and Chi set out. Um and uh on on that continuum within our study, we have what we call focused self-explanations, which are open-ended, but focused on a particular aspect of the problem. So they're not um, quite as unconstrained as fully open-ended, um, but um, the student still has to generate their own self-explanation, uh, but they're given sort of a hint and they're pointed to um, what they should be self-explaining. As a middle ground, we, we experiment with scaffolded self-explanation. And then finally, um, the base version of the game, as I mentioned earlier, has menu-based self-explanation, which are highly constrained self-explanations. So according to uh, the Wiley and, and Chi ICAP model, um, they would hypothesize that the focus self-explanations would end up being the, the most beneficial for learning because they would cause the student to have a, a more of a struggle to, to be able to self-explain and not be um, given the answer as easily as they get it with, for, ins for instance, self uh, menu-based self-explanation. This was reported in a paper um, from ICLS um, that just happened this past summer. And the results of the study show that students in the focus self-explanation group learn more as shown on the delayed test than the menu-based self-explanation group. And there were no other significant effects. Re 
Regarding um, time on task, the menu-based group spent significantly less time than the focused or scaffolded self-explanation. Um, so this indicates that at least um, the menu-based approach takes less time. Um, yet the only significant effect of engagement was that students in the focused self-explanation group reported a significantly higher sense of, of mastery. So in conclusion, um, the focused self-explanation led to better learning than the menu-based self-explanation without a loss of engagement. Um, and this result, uh, I would say, is, is in line with the ICAP theory. In contrast to the Johnson and Mayer study that I mentioned earlier, where they found menu-based self-explanations -expl led to better learning uh, than open-ended self-explanations. So this, the suggestion of our results, therefore, is that um, focused self-explanations used in the context of a, a learning game may be better for deeper and more conceptual learning. Okay, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, especially since we've lost time with me having to uh, uh, quickly do screen share again, I'm gonna skip the mindfulness study. If anyone's interested, please uh, talk to me afterwards because I do wanna get to the uh, main overall results. So key key takeaways I'd like to I'd like to talk away about. So this I tried to give sort of a lightning review of the studies. It's, it's hard to do that when you have so many studies and they're and they're kind of disparate in, in what they're focused on. But I tried to give at least a, a sense of what all the studies are that we've done with the game. Um, so what I want to talk about now is sort of the key takeaways that I think have, have emerged from the work that we've done with decimal point since 2014. I, I would say that the most fundamental finding. Um, which emerged in our very first study, is that a digital game can lead to better learning outcomes than a more conventional approach. And, and that was um, a pretty strong finding that we got in their very first study. Uh, given the state of science as of 2014, that was probably our most important, uh, a pretty important finding, because as I mentioned, there hadn't been much evidence that math focused games had actually um, led to uh, benefits in comparison to more um, uh, typical uh, instructional approaches. The most robust, most robust finding, I mentioned that in five separate studies, female students have learned more um, from the game than uh, male, male students. And these have been in five different versions of the game. And this is a uh, subject of a coming um, journal paper uh, that uh, my PhD student, we, uh, is the first author on. It's also the focus of, of his thesis. Perhaps our most surprising finding, although the gender effect could also be a choice um, of a surprising finding, is that hints and error message don't necessarily better support learning in a digital learning game. And perhaps this is because this leads to an unwanted inter interruption of the, of the game flow. Um, and as mentioned earlier, this could also be that the struggle students have without hints and feedback could lead to um, deeper learning. I would say that our most central um, learning science contribution is, is that of the self-explanation study that I, I mentioned. Um, and in fact, a particular type of self-explanation, what I call the so focused self-explanations, has led to the best learning outcomes. And we have some evidence that this may be a key also to the gender effect. That's one of the things that we is exploring in his um, thesis research. And um, our finding is also interesting because it runs counter to that Johnson and Mayer study that I briefly mentioned. Um, the second theme of the talk, really, I haven't really explicitly talked about it very much, but hopefully it emerged um, uh, just kind of naturally from the different studies I've talked about, is that digital learning games can provide this kind of rich environment for experimenting with many aspects of learning. And as you can see, a lot of the studies have, have varied quite a bit in the, um, in the different Thing that we were focusing on, the different aspect of, uh, of learning and the different uh, learning device that we included in the game. Another key takeaway is that a learning game can be built with a tutoring system engine and ITS principles. Um, the ITS model helps to structure um, the instructional aspects of the game. And also, if it's built from scratch, this approach allows um, for more than gamification. There's, there's a, um, a fair amount of research where there's an existing tutoring, tutoring system where that gamification is, is applied to that system, adding game features to the existing 
tutoring system. But in this case, we built the system directly from 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 scratch um, as a game and not as a tutoring system uh, that was gamified. Um, an interesting question that's arisen during our research is whether games are better suited for learning at home or in, in a classroom. So for instance, in study two, the one where I talked about student autonomy versus system control, students in the classroom uh, may not have really felt in control of their learning due to the influence of being in a classroom and having a teacher there. So per perhaps autonomy and agency would have been more greatly felt at home. In that particular study, we didn't study students at home. That was the, the hint study that we did later, but it'd be interesting to see if they would um, exercise more agency if they were using the game at home. Um, and because students are used to using digital games um, at home and it's sort of as a fun activity. Um, so can we fully engage and motivate students in school with activities perceived to be for, for out of school? That's an open question, I would say. And we just um, touched on the tip of this iceberg um, in the dichotomy with our, our study for uh, the remote versus in classroom. But, but perhaps this opened up an interesting area of study for, for games as a, as a research platform, home versus um, in, in the classroom. Another thing that you may have noticed is that an interesting and important observation, um, since it has implications for game design and for how we should approach future game-based learning research is that many of our interventions didn't actually affect learning. Um, our most significant learning difference was found when we compared the game versus non-game, um, but when we can't com compare different versions of the game, as you might recall, we didn't see very many uh, differences in, in learning. Um, and this could be evidence that it's tricky to significantly change learning by tweaking individual features. Um, and it further, further suggests that perhaps students are more consistent in how they play learning games or more resistant um, to our efforts to change how they play the games than we might think. Um, and a distinction that's often made in intelligent tutoring systems, which was uh, first articulated by um, Kurt Van Lane, in which problem ordering and selection is called the outer loop and interactions within problems is called the inner loop, led to a distinction in learning outcomes. More specifically, we didn't see learning differences when manipulating the outer loop, for example, that student agency study and the in, indirect control and also the mindfulness study that I didn't have a chance to, to talk through. Um, but the inner loop did lead to differences, um, at least in some respects, for um, hints and errors and with self-explanation. So uh, just a little bit about the future, where, where we'd like to go um, in future studies. Um, for instance, we have thought about exploring the assistance dilemma beyond just hints and, and feedback, the assistance dilemma. Uh, again, this is um, Ken and, and Vincent formulated this idea of how much assistance is the right amount assist, of, of assistance. And we think we could explore that um, pretty well within the game context. Um, we actually had started this work by wanting to make a game of erroneous examples and, and presenting erroneous examples to students where they could, as a game, try to fix the, the examples. But we didn't, we ended up not following up on that. So we could go back to that. All of our um, research has been individual learning. Um, I don't believe I mentioned that, but I think it was probably apparent from the way I described the study. So there was no collaboration, it was all individual student learning. So we could explore that. Um, we could also look at other related math domains, for instance, whole numbers and, and fractions. Um, it'd be a pretty easy uh, changeover to see if the domain switch uh, to, to explore some of these issues in, in, in a different uh, math domain. Uh, we'd also like to uh, look at the transfer of game and learning principles to other games. And in fact, um, uh, a new NSF grant that I'm working on is exactly going to uh, look at that. It would also be interesting to investigate issues of diversity and equity in the game. For instance, there might be unconscious bias in the game mechanics and the artwork of the game, given that the game was designed almost exclusively by, by white people, this could be the case. Relatedly, um, there could be an ethnicity effect. Uh, I'm collaborating with a colleague on an NSF racial equity proposal to actually explore that issue. And finally, we have also planned to use affect detectors to better understand students' um, 
behavior in playing the game and their affective processes while playing. And we've done um, some work with uh, Ryan Baker's lab at the University of Pennsylvania in that area. And we have follow-up plans for, for studying that more deeply. So um, that's, that's the end of my talk. Hopefully I did leave some time, not a lot, but I did leave some time. Um, yeah, so a chapter that uh, my PhD student and I just finished, uh, it's called Digital Learning Games and Artificial Intelligence in, in AI Ed, a review. Um, if you're interested in finding out more broadly, that chapter is not just about this game, but about a broad set of games that apply AI to game-based learning. Um, so if you're interested, um, either go to this URL or, or send me an email. And finally, just a thank you to all of my uh, wonderful collaborators. Um, obviously, this is not just my work, um, but many have participated in, in uh, the work that I've described today. With that, I'll stop. Thank you, Bruce. There is, um, there's questions in the chat. There has been a lively discussion in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm sorry because of especially getting uh, distracted by the screen going on on me. I didn't have any chance to really, to really follow. Um, oh, there's a lot of questions. I'll let you. I'll leave it to you to manage how you do things. If you want to call on people, if you want to just respond, I, I see that Ken also raised his hand. So, up to you. Okay, um, well, uh, yeah, maybe maybe it's a little better to be interactive. Um, Ken, you want to go ahead and ask your question, and then I am looking at the chat, and I can I can jump back to that, but go ahead, Ken. I, I, well, I think somebody asked this in the chat as well, uh, but uh, uh, the why on your first study is is interesting. I was just looking at the paper, and the paper emphasizes that it's not because it's a complicated game. Um, and its simplicity may be a merit, but um, I, I didn't get to the point where I kind of said, well, what a, what game features do you think do matter? And maybe, you know, do, what, what do you know, if, if anything, about how those game features might change intermediate observable behaviors in the game? Like those errors, right? There's a big error difference in that, in that first study. Why, why would there be less errors in the game, for example? Yeah, and, and we haven't yet identified, we've, we've looked at different aspects of the game, um, but it, it, the log data that we have doesn't directly uh, allow us to sort of get a sense of which particular features um, might have been in contrast to the non-game. So we are looking at that. In fact, we're actually rerunning that study um, coming up uh, in the fall because um, it's relevant to the work that he is doing on his PhD thesis. We have found that the self-explanation um, appears to make um, some difference in learning. So we're actually, that's one thing we're studying in the falls. We're going we're, we're gonna to drop the self-explanation and compare it to self-explanation to having no self-explanation in the game and the non-game context. So that, that does appear to... Uh, to, to mediate what we're what we're seeing, but um, but we don't have it. You mean in that original study, both had self explanation, but maybe the game made students more likely to, yeah, engage constructively. Yeah. They but they both did have self explanation, both the game and the non game. Thanks. Okay, sure. Uh, so um, I guess, uh, David, you asked what makes something a game? Uh, what are the unique features of instructional games versus just instruction? Uh, well, there we took our, our, our hint from those who had developed games before us. So, so things like, um, you know, create, having a narrative or, um, uh, inducing some sort of curiosity in in the game or some uh, other game features are which we didn't include were things like having um, points that you can score and and you can compare to other students that's actually a thing that's often used when people gamify um, intelligent tutors is is having sort of a point 
system um, and, and maybe getting uh, badges and awards. Um, so those are, there, there isn't really a succinct definition for what a game is, but there's just these various features that, you know, are commonly seen in games that are meant to sort of uh, motivate students and, and engage students. Uh, yes, uh, the question from Sasha in the beginning, the studies that only found small effect sizes, you're referring, I think, to the math studies, the five studies that I referenced. Yeah, those were um, what Mayer called media comparison studies, which were where you take a game and you compare it to um, a more traditional instructional approach. Um, so those those were, and, 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 and those were not, as I mentioned there, did not show that there was a great benefit to, um, uh, to game-based learning, at least in the five studies that were available at that time in 2014. Okay, I'm going to just scroll down quickly. Uh, study 2A, what type of control, this is from Camille, what type of control could have created uh, learning gain difference uh, compared to studies by Dr. Levin? What could have been done different to see such an effect? Um, so here you're asking, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I even know what you're asking, but maybe you can, Camille. Are you here? You want to? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm. I'm here. Um, so what I was uh, trying to say, like Dr. Eleven, find those like differences when students have some control of problem solving, uh, like when they select which problem that they want to select in the equation, like tutor. And <clears throat> I was wondering, you didn't find that effect in your studies, and I'm just trying to understand what you might be doing differently to see that effect is you said that you were expecting to find that uh, differences between agency and no agency group and I just trying to understand what what we could do better or I don't know should we just uh, forget about this um, idea or should we try with other studies what is your kind of thinking about that well, yeah, like I said, we, we didn't see much difference when we gave that agency to, to students um, where we let them choose what games they would play instead of the, the prescribed order that we you know, provided. You know, they had a dashboard um, in the learning focused condition. They would see the skills that they still needed to master, you know, similar to what you see in, in uh, intelligent tutoring systems, the open learner model. Um, and then in the, in the enjoyment focused condition, they were prompted to play games that they had already reported that they'd enjoyed or related games to the, to the games that they'd enjoyed. And that was done because after they play a game, they would report you know, how much they enjoyed that game. And then that was used as data to feed back to them um, how much they enjoyed it. So at least, and, and that was the point I was trying to make too at the end about the, um, uh, you know, that's kind of an outer loop uh, issue, right? Because you're allowing the, the student to control the outer loop, but somehow that didn't seem to make a difference either to their learning or to their enjoyment. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but maybe maybe it, if it was more in the inner loop, if maybe the choices we provided were in the inner loop, maybe that would have made more of a more of a difference. Because we did see in in a few instances where inner loop uh, changes to the game did lead to some learning differences. Thank you. Sure. I think we have time for a few more questions. Okay. Okay, I'm uh, I'm sorry if I'm not okay. answering everybody's question, but I'm just quickly looking at, at all the questions that have come up here in the chat. I'm gonna look at Vincent's question. Is the result that females learn more specific to the game conditions? Or did it also happen in non-game control? Good question. Um, it it was specific to the game condition. So in that first study where we um, did the game versus non-game, um, in the non-game uh, condition, female students didn't didn't learn more than male students, but in the game condition, they did. So there's something about the game environment that seemed to induce um, female students to to learn to have better learning outcomes which is what we're exploring. Again, it's, that's part of what uh, Wee's looking at in his uh, PhD thesis.
Can as his hand raised. Uh, did Ray Lowe's students have a higher pretest? Yeah, they did. They did have a higher pretest. The ones that we ultimately kept in the analysis because a lot of students just didn't finish the materials, so they, you know, we didn't keep those in. And the, the remote students who did finish and had the higher learning gains also had higher pretests. So that's why I made the comment that it looked like the higher prior knowledge students, um, you know, uh, did better remotely. So Hayden asks, have you done or considered doing studies with online school or homeschool students to see how these pandemic results compare to students familiar with remote or at home? schooling yeah that's a good question because of course one of the things that happened is the study that we did was right when the pandemic happened and many of these students probably weren't used to to doing that kind of work at home like more or less replacing what they do in the classroom at home whereas students who um, are already homeschooled um, and have been learning from home for quite some time uh, maybe have adapted in a way that would lead to different results so um that's that's an interesting suggestion, but we have not yet um, studied that. Uh, Ken says, John, going back to your question about study one, it seems it was pseudo random assignment at the classroom. Oh, level. you can, yeah, I think that's resolved. Okay, that's resolved. Okay, it was. I'm not sure. Um, but Bruce, was that is that generally true for all the studies that they were um, basically you were trying to balance the characteristics of classes and then you made groups, no right. randomization? No, not for all of the studies. We only did it in, in the case of that study because we were concerned that kids in the same class where some kids were playing a game and some kids you know, we're using like a standard kind of interface that we'd have issues with that. Um, of course, we don't know that that would have happened. But we sort of predicted that that wouldn't be a good mix. So what we did is we we assigned per class. Um, but we did try to um, find out, you know, we tried to balance in terms of higher performing and lower performing classes in terms of what the teachers told us. Yes. Um, and uh, what about, um, like, is it always ran, uh, assignment by classes and never within class, never or student level random assignment? No, there, we, we did do student um, assignment on, on a number of the experiences. I think in almost every study except for that first one. Ah, uh, okay, good. And that was just because of that contrast. Because remember, everything we studied after that were different versions of the game compared to one another. So in that case, students would, um, wouldn't have that same impact. There was, I didn't have a chance to talk about the mindfulness experiment because I knew I was running short on time, but, but there we, we did assign um, randomly but at the student level, but we found out that might've had a, a, an effect that was not good because the control condition was no mindfulness and then there was a condition where there was mindfulness. So you had some students who were like being asked to uh, close their eyes and you know do things that you're prompted to do when you do mindfulness. So we kind of suspect that some of the kids were self-conscious about that and that it really didn't have the impact we thought because there was too much variation in the classroom based on that. So that was another case where I think we probably could have and, and should have maybe done at the classroom uh, level as opposed to at the student level. Great, thanks for the info. Mm -hmm. Sure. One last question, Bruce. Okay. Okay, so Leah asks a good question. You've mentioned that across studies, female students generally perform better than male students. Does that also hold across racial demographics? So for example, do Latina students perform better than male students. We actually don't know that because um, we did not ask for that information in the study. So we don't, we don't have that information. Um, 
but that would be a, a good add to studies moving forward um, to get a better uh, handle uh, on that. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, Bruce, for the great talk. And thank you, everybody, for the great questions. And um, applaud the virtual applause again. And I hope to see you have, see you all again next month. Thanks, everyone. Maybe give Bruce a chance to save the chat if. Oh, yeah.